So uh, those are, are some of the, the uh, targets there. Uh, probably fewer people in the room know anything about why it would make sense to have something on parallel computation, so to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, probably uh, many people have heard about what's popularly called Moore's Law. So what's popularly called Moore's Law is that the price performance of computers doubles every 18 months. That's actually not Moore's Law, although that's what everyone says it is. What Moore's Law actually is that the density of transistors that can be fabricated and, and controlled and make <coughs> computer circuits doubles about every 18 months. Okay, and the reason I'm making the distinction is, turns out Moore's Law is still true. So transistor density is still escalating very rapidly. It always used to be true that if you could pack in twice as many transistors, you could do something good with them and end up with a faster, cheaper computer. That is no longer true. So the effective part of Moore's Law has stopped working. So the price performance improvements are not coming anymore. And what people are doing instead is they're saying, well, we can't make faster computers, but we can, we can, we can give you more of them. Okay, and so you get these quad-core, other multi-core kinds of machines where the, the, the thing is, they're giving you four computers where you used to have one. Well, that's great if you can find a way to use the four computers effectively, and that's a really hard problem because you have to make four things happen at once, roughly, and, and this is difficult. Uh, there's been a, a lot of interesting talk around this. Well, you, you see here that uh, you know, this is something David Patterson is a very prominent computer scientist saying this is the biggest challenge in 50 years, you know, dealing, uh, uh, dealing with this. One of the things that gets said is, about this is, well, parallel processes are intrinsically harder to understand than serial processes, and so we're really hosed here, because getting people to understand how to program parallel uh, uh, things is just intrinsically harder because it's so unnatural cognitively. My colleague Mike Eisberg and I have talked about this and find that we agree that, well, it might be, perhaps, that parallel processes are, in some fundamental way, uh, hard to understand, but we have no plausible basis for believing that. You know, no one, no one has uh, done the right, the kind of study that you would need to really uh, know that. And, and one shouldn't uh, avoid noticing that the amount of time we've put into helping people understand serial processes dwarfs anything we've put into parallel processes, so we really don't know what would happen if we worked at that. And Mike, in particular, had the idea, well, for instance, what if we came up with games and puzzles that got kids thinking about parallel phenomena? Maybe we could just wait a few years, and then the parallel programming problem would be solved, because kids would find it all really natural. So, so well, fine. Let's, let's ask our students to see if they can't do this. Okay. So what happened? Well, to lead into that, I want to tell you a little bit more about the course and some of the problems and how we've dealt with them. So anybody who works in the design sciences will recognize the term premature commitment. So this is one of the pathologies of design and the way it works is that faced with a, a design problem where in the reality is there's a huge space of possibilities that you should be exploring. What people tend to do is very strong biases. They think for a minute, they say, well, maybe you could do it this way and then they never think about anything else. Okay, so they ignore all the other possibilities. That's what's called premature commitment. And we saw that big time. So students at the beginning of the semester would come up with some idea for a game that wasn't a very good idea, and they'd spend the whole rest of the semester elaborating it, not surprisingly, we felt, especially in hindsight, the results were unexciting. So to avoid that, in recent editions of the class, the middle third of the semester, about five weeks, is spent in something we call gamelet madness, in that period, the students produce a game a week for five weeks. And only after they've done all of that do they get to pick something to work on in the final five weeks. So over the last few years, we've produced many hundreds of games in this class. Okay? Because this class has, say, 40 people in it. There's many hundreds of games we're talking about here. Well, I'm going to give you the high water marks. So here's one. So this is, this is under the heading of uh, working with parallel computation. So a few of you might possibly recognize something called the dining philosopher's problem. This is a, a classical, sort of simplified, idealized problem in synchronizing parallel processes. That's enough for you to know. Uh, I, I won't take you through uh, uh, the rest of this. It's the kind of problem that's used in textbooks. It's used to try out new ideas in the 
uh, in the literature. And uh, so we had actually a number of games where students basically came up with simulations of the dining philosopher's problem. I guess I need to tell you a little bit more about the problem. So in, in this uh, common form of it, you have uh, five philosophers sitting around a table and they, they want to eat. And uh, there are, in one form, chopsticks. One chopstick uh, between each two philosophers, but you need two chopsticks to eat. Okay? So if one philosopher is quick and grabs both adjacent chopsticks, well then the flanking philosophers can't eat for as long as those chopsticks are tied up. Okay? So the challenge is to arrange it so that none of the philosophers starve, that they're able to eat in some sort of rotation. That's the, that's the challenge. So what these simulations did was to put this in the form of a kind of interactive puzzle where you could control which philosopher picks up which chopstick when and when they put it down and that kind of thing. And that might sound, at first blush, pretty good. But it turns out it's useless from the point of view of actually understanding anything. Because what's really important about the dining philosopher's problem is, a, is framing a policy for the management of the chopsticks. Just saying, pick up this chopstick, and now pick up that one, and now pick up that one, and now put down that one. You don't learn anything about the problem for that, from, from that. And despite a lot of pushing, we couldn't get any of the students who took this step to take the further step and come up with an activity where you're really controlling things at the level of policy. Now that's where the conceptual content is. Here's another exemplar of a pretty large class of, I'll, I'll call them sort of near misses. So this is a small example of uh, a, a version of a game called Sokoban. I don't know if any of you have played Sokoban. If you like games at all, Sokoban is really a terrific kind of game. It, it involves pushing things around to try to move them around, but the rule is you can only push, you can't pull. And just that constraint, turns out, sets up for a lot of very rich puzzle structure around that. So it was natural, and a number of students came up with essentially parallel Sokobans. We have more than one pusher. In, in the regular game, there's just one pusher, and you're just controlling it. But So um, uh, in, in one form of this, you have different pushers, but you have only one stream of instructions that you're going to give to the pushers, and you, so you have to contrive things so that you come up with instructions that can be sensibly executed by both pushers, even though they're in different situations, without getting into uh, trouble somehow. And again, this might seem fairly reasonable, and actually this one was a pretty good game, but again, you don't really learn anything useful about parallel computation from simply figuring out how to do this. It's at the wrong conceptual level. Switching more over to the biology side, and uh, numerically the biology problems were more uh, popular, but the, but the entries were kind of bunched. And so if you, if you were to go back to the list of Klinkowski's difficulties, a lot of them come under the heading of emergence. Okay, so people have trouble understanding that complex behavior doesn't have to have complex origins. You can have a relatively simple set of mechanisms that can produce a very complex range of, of phenomena. Uh, so we had actually a number of games, some of which were kind of fun, which, which do illustrate emergence in some way, but not in a way that could plausibly link back to really anything to do with biology. We just see the raw fact of emergence, and in, that case, in many cases not all that clear as well. This happens to be a sort of programmable version of something called the game of life. Uh, this is a little more raw, I think. In, in the particular programming framework the students are using, which, which we're having them use because it makes it easy for them to do the implementation of all of this, so they're not spending all their time on that. So in this particular framework, it's easy to create uh, little things that have interesting behavior. And what this person did was to create a lot of things which kind of acted like chemicals. And you sort of put some of them on the screen and all kinds of unexpected and kind of visually interesting things happen. like fountains and cascades of stuff and so on. Okay, so yeah, there's emergence happening there, but in a way that somebody gets any sort of useful concept from it, hard to argue that. Okay, so why is this as, is this as, good, as, good, as, as good as we've got them uh, so far? Well, one could say that there's a really big problem in the middle of this that the game hype people really, really haven't adequately thought about. Well, but they should have. This is the question. Yes. I mean, presumably, 
at least 90% of the students in your course do not understand these difficult biological concepts. Indeed, that's right, and so that's that's definitely one of the know. issues. So that and that was true despite our efforts to provide them with appropriate background material and the like. But I think it is definitely an issue <laughs> that we didn't do enough of that. Yeah. Or we so didn't you thought your well students would learn by sending them to the library? Excuse me? <laughs> you thought your students would learn biology by sending them to the library? Uh, well, that wasn't the library, actually. Well, written material. Well, no, interactive websites and I see. stuff like that. But definitely something we need to do better on, which we will be trying to do. So that particular part of the prescription, we're going we're gonna to be staying with. But anyway, rate, this, this paper is not, not new. This is 1999. But anybody who's interested in games and education really ought to be familiar with this paper. And our students are. So we read and discuss this, this paper in the, in the part of the class that's kind of headed learning theory for game, game designers. So this is actually a game that, in, in a different form, will be familiar to many people here. So the FAT simulation uh, collection here includes something called electric field hockey, which is what this game is. So. Uh, electric field hockey was designed to be something that people could learn something about electric fields from. And the way it works, I'll try to use this picture to describe it. Uh, so you have a puck, which in this case is a positively, positively charged particle that at the beginning of a round of play might be located, say, here. Okay? And it's fixed initially. You then have a supply of other charged particles that you position on the playing field here. And when you have them in a position that you like, you release the puck. And electrostatic forces drive the puck somewhere. And you're trying to drive it into this goal here. And this is a pretty <laughs> simple level of the game in that there's just a, a simple barrier here so that you can't, you can't send the puck directly to the goal. You have to get it to go around the barrier. Okay? So what, what, what's happened here is that there's been a, a like charge placed behind the puck here that's going to push it that way. But to keep it from continuing this way, there's a kind of a bumper in the form of another positive charge down here that changes the trajectory in that way. Okay? Well, again, this might seem like a reasonable thing. But in a lot of careful work, Miller now showed that basically you don't learn anything important about electric fields from this game, no matter how much you play it and how well you come to be able to play it. Okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, if you didn't know that like charges repel, you might learn that from the game. But that fact in itself, I think Mike Dubson and Steve and others would say, that fact in itself, it's kind of like the uses of the parts of the buffalo. That, that's just, that's, that isn't particularly a big deal. Okay? Beyond that, you don't learn anything. Okay, so what was done was pre-testing and post-testing of things that you would like somebody to know about electric fields and how they work, and you don't learn any of those, those things. One of the, I mean, most, well, anyway, one of the reasons you don't learn anything is that you can get to play, and this is something that generalizes to many other games, you can get to play this game really well by a process of tinkering. Okay, so you sort of put the charges down there, and well, gee, that didn't quite go where I wanted to, but what if I move this charge over here? Oh, that's a little better, I'll move it farther that way. Okay, and you can get so that, and people did, they got so that they can play really well. But being able to do that tinkering, and even to be able to do it kind of in an anticipatory way, to get it so you don't have to do much fussing around, again, there's very little about electric fields that you really need to know in order to do that. And as a result, you don't learn much. Okay? 